The life of Américo Paredes spanned over eight decades and included events that changed the world forever. He was born September 3, 1915, during the devastation of World War I and the chaos of the Mexican Revolution. He remembered. I was born in Brownsville. I'm a Brownsville boy. On September 3rd, 1915, during the height of the so-called border troubles, the Sediciosos, when there was a kind of ethnic cleansing, to use the current word, along the border, when rangers and others uh, murdered a number of Mexicans and intimidated a lot of others to leave the country. Américo Paredes grew up between two worlds along the U.S.-Mexican border, one written about in books, the other sung about in ballads and narrative and folk tales. Until the age of 14, he and his younger brother, Amador, would spend their summers on their Uncle Vicente's ranch near Matamoros. The rest of the family went to San Antonio or South Padre Island. Paredes reminisced. We would head immediately across the river, uh, the back way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody had had little boats hidden along the, uh, the uh, reeds there. And we would stay there for three months, living like Mexicans, listening to the old people tell their stories. My father would come down sometimes also. And then at the end of August, they drag us back to Brownsville. The ones there, I was living in another world. The decades of the 1930s left a lasting impression upon Américo Paredes. He said that although he did live well in school, initially, the Great Depression virtually broke his family. Paredes recalled that his family had no money. Although he survived, many other Mexicans dropped out of school during those years. It was near the end of his junior year that the young Paredes entered a poetry contest in 1933 sponsored by Trinity College, located then in Waxahachie, Texas. When Paredes saw the announcement posted on the bulletin board, he completed the application and submitted a poem entitled, A Sonnet Tonight. It was this junior school teacher, junior English teacher that got it, I suppose. She just put it on the bulletin board. It wasn't announced anywhere. I saw it, and on my own, I wasn't going to ask the lady <laughs> anything. I went and got the uh, the uh, address and sent a poem on my own. It was a sonnet tonight, a very forgettable poem, really, but it won first prize. His education combined both classroom learning and family learning. He continually took an interest in the folklore and music of the South Texas border. My one year that I taught in a public school in, in Austin, Texas at a junior high, it was the school that was, it was, uh, it was in East Austin, it was predominantly Mexican-American and African-American, and the two did not mix. They would come into the classroom and they would sit in their separate sides of the room. No matter what I tried to do to get them to mix, they didn't want to mix with each other in, in the sitting arrangement. And so little by little, by doing things with the artwork, they were able to mix. And finally, uh, we were working on a mural that we were painting on paper because we couldn't paint on the walls. Uh, and we were working after school and on weekends because I, I couldn't put that into the curriculum. They already had the curriculum figured out for me. so I. I couldn't have that much of an input. So this was like an elective that we did after school, and the kids would come, and I had, I had my record player, and I had sodas for them, and they would come, and they would stay after school till around 5.30 or 6 o'clock, painting on the floor, because that was, it was, we were painting on a big piece of paper. And uh, we were trying to finish these two murals for the Cinco de Mayo celebrations at the school, and so the last weekend before Cinco de Mayo, we were there all day Saturday and all day Sunday, and we were still working on it Sunday night. And then there we were on the floor painting, and the kid, one of the girls said, Psst, Miss, Miss, look. I said, look at what, what? She says, look over there, look at what? She says, look out that window. So I look up, and I see all of these guns and policemen 
pointing their guns through the open windows at us. And I, oh my God. So I got up very calmly. The kids were horrified. They were terrified. And they stayed on the floor with their brushes in there and they didn't dare move. I stood up and just as I was standing up, this big sheriff comes in with his, I mean, huge guy with his gun, two guns. And he said, what is going on here? <laughs> I tried to explain that we were working on these murals and on and on. And, and here I am, a skinny teacher with long hair, and I got these little glasses, and I looked like one of the students. And, uh, and he wouldn't believe me that I was the art teacher, so I finally pulled out my driver's license and all my IDs, and, and finally he believed me. And he said, well, did you inform the, the principal that you were going to be here? And I said, yes, I did. He said, well, we were not informed, so you've got to clean up and get out of here now. So we had to quickly finish up and, and get out. And, and, but as I was talking to him, two of my other students that I had sent to the auditorium to check up with the janitor on the installation of the paper cutout came running down the hall so fast. They were terrified. And they, came, they almost jumped up on me when they got into the room because there was two cops chasing them. So uh, it was difficult because I knew that, that, that there needed to be change in the structure and there needed, there needed to be change in, in how we would, we would actually get the kids to work with each other and to work on, on things that would challenge them. And so the only way to do it was after school and on the weekends. And so it was difficult. I have been doing Chicano art for Chicanos, but also for others to see who we are as a people. If my heart and humanity is seen through my art, then hopefully I will not be excluded from rightfully participating in this society, my American society. And so, entonces aquí les doy un pedacito de mi corazón en mi arte. And so now I give you a little piece of my heart in my art. Lights down. Thank you. So this is at my mother's friend's house, next door neighbor. She had a, a cold that turned into a lung infection. And of course, she had been to the doctor to get her prescription medication. And you can see it here. But she also asked the curandera to come and do a cleansing for her. So that, because so many times when you get sick, it's not just a physical illness. It's also an emotional or a spiritual illness. And you need a whole healing, not just a physical healing. And so the curandera came and brought her herbs and made teas and she rubbed her down. And also she burned copal incense in the uh, coffee can here uh, and read prayers for her. So we had to become migrants. And I remember uh, uh, having to struggle with that uh, to the point that even as a junior in college, I did not know anything else but working and going to school. I didn't know about scholarships, I didn't know about loans, I didn't know about work study. I was finally introduced to some of that later on in college. And uh, I, the only scholarship that I competed for was uh, to go to the junior college. And it was offered by the Mexican Chamber of Commerce. Now here, uh, in high school, I was uh, an exceptional student in the sense that I was upset at what things uh, had happened to me and to others like me. For example, uh, uh, I uh, became the class president uh, my junior year because the population of my high school changed from, from majority Anglo to majority Mexican my junior year. And I was able to organize, and that's when I finally also went out for the football team because I made it a point to start school on time uh, before I was migrant, so I'd leave early and come back late, so I never could be involved in school activities and so. But the football team was segregated so that we always made the B team. And I was almost as large as I am now, certainly not the weight, but about the same height. And I was pretty physical kind of young kid. So we would be used as the dummies to tackle. And well, I figured that out real quick. And I said, I'm not gonna take all these golpes. Uh, no way. And just by accident, uh, I happened to, uh, to walk by the auditorium one day and, and all these pretty girls, Anglo, were, were practicing. They were saying poetry and acting out things. And, and I saw a couple of white guys, but basically no Chicanos. And I'm looking through the window, uh, again, no air conditioning. Uh, and the, the speech coach, uh, a fellow by the name of Aston Pegues, yelled at me, for me to get away and go away or, or come in. Well, I mean, I was interested in the pretty girls, so you know, by the time my hormones were in full swing and, 
and I, and, and I was not accepting this, this social distance uh, between Mexicanos and Chicanos. I really didn't know much about all that. Uh, I knew that we were different. We lived on a different side of town, and we were migrants, and we spoke mostly Spanish, and, and the whites didn't have much to do with us. Uh, they made fun of us, uh, beat us up when we spoke Spanish, and the teachers, and you had to hide your tacos when you ate them, uh, things of that sort. So I kind of knew, but, but I didn't know that I could do anything about it. But I was attracted to these girls, you know, and it didn't help that they were blonde and blue-eyed, because that was different. So I went inside, and he says, if you come in here, you're going to have to read poetry. Well, no Chicano is going to read poetry. But I said, in my mind, I process but if I want to be near them, I better learn poetry. So he handed me this thing, and I don't even remember what it was, but I looked at it, and he said, okay, come on up here and read. Well, uh, I read, and uh, he, was, he stopped me halfway through. He said, you know, you're the first Mexican kid that doesn't speak with an accent, and you enunciate. I didn't know what that word meant. Uh, and and he's, he told me all these wonderful skills that I had. Well, I didn't know. I, mean, I should have known, as we all do in, in older age, that all of us come with talent, uh, different talents, but we all have it. You need someone to nurture that. Well, he started working with me and said, well, you're going to be in the one-act play, and you're going to be in a debate team, and you're going to try out for declamation, extemporaneous speaking. And all these were words that I had never heard before, much less interscholastic league. I thought that was something that had to do with space or something. You know? Well, uh, because I was interested in those gringuitas, I, I practiced and he taught me how to speak. And I became the first Chicano state champion in Texas in public speaking. I mean, it was unheard of. That same year, a, a young man by the name of uh, Ricardo Gallegos, Richie Gallegos, also won the state championship in the mile run for our size of school. Another one, Ricardo Romo, who's now the president of UTSA, won the, the largest school mile run, uh, also named Ricardo. So we were kind of the champions, you know, and, and we, everybody was making a big to-do about this. Uh, this was 1961. I was a junior and class president. So that time I also had to do the, the, the prom for the seniors. And we raised money and we had an election for prom servers. And my principal, who was my hero at the time, a great big guy, uh, ex-Marine, very disciplinarian, uh, about 6'3", 240 pounds, just, just a mountain of a man. I wanted to be like him until that day when I took in the returns uh, for the election of prom servers and we were all Chicanos and Chicanas. And he threw them away. And he said, no, we're not going to have race mixing, mix, mixing here. And he drew a line on a piece of paper, wrote a bunch of names and, and handed me and said, now these Mexicans will be the, you know, using the slur, uh, these will be the ones uh, and, and these will be the Anglos and we're not going to have them paired up. And I said, well, that's not what the election was and, and you're invalidating the election and, and I'm not going to do that. He said, well, if you don't, you're going to get expelled. I was born in San Antonio. I was raised on the west side of San Antonio in the barrio. And I look back on it now and realize that we had an incredible wealth of experience. Um, it was always hard for me growing up to identify with the images that we had externally of what a barrio was supposed to be because I didn't feel deprived. I didn't feel it was a slum. I didn't feel it was a ghetto. I felt it was a, a, a fiesta full of all kinds of primos and abuelos and tios and tias. Uh, it was um, a, a life full of cuentos. Um, we had a tremendous history. That's not to say that all of the experiences were perfect or that our treatment was Cinderella type. Uh, our treatment was often mixed with experiences that were negative. And Yet this blended into a total picture of life, uh, a life that was balanced between the positive and the negative, between the um, prejudices and, and, the, um, and the positives, both together. Um, I think about some of the things that happen that I now can laugh about, that I can create characters about, at the time were very confusing. I'll never forget uh, Maria Guadalupe. Soriano, who sat in front of me, and our, our eighth grade science teacher, 
would say, don't speak Spanish, it's a dirty language. And Maria Guadalupe would sit at her desk and she would mumble and she would grumble and she would say, my mother does not speak a dirty language and my grandmother does not speak a dirty language. And she would just mumble and grumble it because she couldn't say it too loud in front of the teacher. Um, so we had these experiences that were negative and I'm surprised today that so many of us survived those experiences and turned it very creatively to the positive. And I look now at the people that I went to junior high with and they've become artists, filmmakers, writers, uh, statesmen, people that contribute to their society uh, and make a uh, positive application of their cultural individuality. Um, I, I'm surprised in part because I also know that there was the negative influence, uh, that there was the frisking going in and out of junior high. We were considered a very tough junior high. Um, we were uh, considered the, uh, the rough side of town. I didn't know this, and I think a lot of my friends didn't know this. When you grow up in something, you think that's the way everybody is. You don't realize that other junior highs are not frisked. And we were frisked going in and out of the cafeteria. The boys would get in one line and the girls would get in another. And uh, the girls had their purses checked and they would check us to make certain we didn't have perfume bottles or deodorant bottles or mirrors or teased hair. And these were the days of bouffant hairstyles, big puffy teased hairstyles in the early 60s and mid 60s. And, and we would ask the teacher, but ma'am, how come we can't have teased hair? And she'd say, oh, because if you get into a fight, you're going to reach into your hair, you're going to pull out the knife, and you're going to stab somebody with it. And we said, oh, ma'am, how come we can't have perfume bottles and deodorant bottles and mirrors in our purses, ma'am? And she'd say, oh, because if you get into a fight, you're going to take that mirror, you're going to break it, and you're going to slash somebody with it. And we said, oh. And we learned a lot in junior high, but it wasn't what they expected us to learn. It was about the stereotypes, and it was about their expectations of us. And young children are always influenced by the expectations. So certainly some of us did go on and uh, do what we were trained to do. The boys were frisked and frisked, and they went on to learn to be frisked. Um, and yet even through all that, we survived because there was a lot of goodness in the values. There was a lot of emphasis on siendo decente. Uh, portándose como la gente, uh, being uh, respetuoso. There were very, very positive values within our culture that survived even all the negative stereotypes that we encountered in the schools. 1960, um, a chemical plant had closed in Brownsville, and uh, I was out of a job. So I returned to high school teaching. And then a friend of mine uh, told me about a federal service entrance exam. This is 61, so I took it, passed it, and I said, I'm going to work for the government for 18 months, save as much as I can in those 18 months, and then go to graduate school. I was already 31, I think, and I did. I taught at high school. I took my civil, civil service exam, and I worked for the Social Security Administration was stationed in Houston Corpus, finally in Brownsville, and that's when I really saved the money. And I resigned, and I had this savings, and I went to New Mexico Highlands. But I loved the little place, and when I had saved my money, and I returned there, and I went one summer, and one long term, and another summer, and I got my uh, MA. In the meantime, I was already making preparations to, uh, to go to graduate school. So I applied to Chapel Hill and to Michigan and uh, Illinois and various other places. And I finally chose Illinois. I, I, liked, I think they had the best economic deal for me. Besides, that's the school I really wanted to go to. My advisor had some friends there. And Luis Leal, uh, a great old man of uh, Mexican and world literature, uh, was there. And I wanted to work with him. And I did. In fact, we even shared an office. So. Uh, but in 63 is when I started in Illinois. In 68, or when I left and then got my degree in 69 here at Trinity, uh, the Chicano movement was fermenting, either at universities or in the political arena outside of the universities, but also literarily. So I said, well, I'll make my contribution 
as a writer. And I did, along with Tomás Rivera, another Texan. Not a Valleyite, he's from the Winter Garden area in Crystal City. So we participated in that, and we uh, garnered a lot of money, uh, particularly from the Ford uh, Foundation. And we secured master's and PhD uh, opportunities for many young men and women who otherwise would have probably received their BA, and that's about it, or their BS if they were in science, and that would have been the end of their career to go into high school teaching. As it is, many of them are now in their 40s uh, because of the efforts that we did in the late 60s, all the way up to around 77, I think. And in the meantime, of course, the Texas legislature is increasing in its membership as far as Mexican Americans are concerned. Mexican American literature really takes off with publishing houses, which are still, um, you know, a going concern today. And it was a very exciting time. But every decade really is an exciting time. It's just that things conjugated in the 60s. There was a larger cadre of educated Mexican-American men and women. And as a Valleyite, I got to know many of them. And, and a former uh, colleague and good friend named Danny Rodriguez at Trinity said, I want you to, to meet Tomás Rivera. And I said, my goodness, I wanted to meet him. And two weeks ago, I missed him. We didn't go to the conference that day. We walked for about four hours. We missed the lunch. We missed every lecture. And all we did was talk about ourselves and about writing and how interested I was. And, I hadn't published the line up to that time, and now I was already 41 years old, I think. And he said, send me some, some of your stuff, and I did. Well, to uh, cut it short, he died in uh, 1984. And in fact, I, w I went to his grave site again this year, as I do every year, usually in May, because that's the month that he died. Uh, and he's buried in Crystal City. Uh, I think we lectured in maybe 20 or 30 universities together in the space of uh, 14 or 15 years. I received I don't know how many letters from um, friends and colleagues from all over the U.S. Uh, letters of condolence and saying, I know how much you miss Tomas, and this is a great loss, uh, but, and we want you to know that our heart goes with you, as if you know, I had lost a brother. Actually, I had lost one of the dearest friends I'd ever had. Most writers write about what they don't. Uh, trouble is, you have to know what it is that you do know. In this piece that I will read for you, it's called Es el Agua. My name is Fructuoso Alaniz Garcia, and I was so named for my Saints Day, the 21st day of January. In English, according to my granddaughter Lucia, my name means bountiful, productive. I find it proper that one so named should be chosen to work the land and to know it and to give it life so that it, the land, return part of that life in grain and cereal, in vegetables, yes, in fruits of labor and of bounty to that person who prepared the land and watched the crops grow from nothing but a hope and a handful of seeds. We have a saying here in the Rio Grande Valley, es el agua, it's the water, the Rio Grande water. It claims you, you understand, it's yours and you belong to it too. No matter where we work, we always come back to the border, to the valley, it's el agua, yeah.